preach again on dream again. We're doing a series through April, April 15th about God giving us a new dream in our life, or resurrecting old dreams that we had given up on. And so when God's going to do something in your life, or he's going to give you something, then he shows it to you first, not with your natural eyes, but with your spiritual eyes. And so just like you have natural eyes, then you have spiritual eyes too that can see the unseen. That's what faith is. Faith is seeing the unseen, seeing things that haven't come in the natural yet, but we can have them by faith and possess them just as if we have them, even though we haven't seen the evidence yet. And so faith is the evidence of things not seen. And so Paul prayed for the Ephesian church that their spiritual eyes would be open, that they would know the hope of their calling and know what God had for them, his calling upon their life. And so God has a calling on every life. It may not be the vocational ministry, but he's got a plan, he's got a purpose, he has a calling for you. He wants to show that to you, and so he will give you a vision of what he wants you to do. Some people would ask, how did you know that you were called to preach? Because God gave me visions of being called to preach. I'm talking about seeing something with your mind. Seeing something with your imagination. And I didn't pass out or see an angel or anything like that. But God spoke to my mind and gave me a vision. And so God many times speaks to us by putting thoughts in our mind. And uh, he'll show us what he has for us in the future. Show us the, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. And so when God wanted Abraham to be the father of many nations... He took him out. He showed him the stars and said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And so uh, Joel 2.28 says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And so Joel is talking about the revival of the last days. The last days begin on the day of Pentecost. We're living in the very last of the last days. I don't know exactly what day Jesus is coming, but he is coming soon. I can't tell you the day, but I can tell you that we're in the season. And there's a lot of signs that are happening right now, or happened in the past, that indicate that Jesus is coming again. The rapture of the church it happens first, and it's a catching away of the saints. So we have to be prepared, and we have to be ready. Now the, the word revive, the root word that we get the word revival from, is associated with the, the word dreams in the Bible. In the first place it's found is in Genesis chapter 45, and it's talking about Jacob. And so Jacob was an old man, and he was the father of Joseph. And you remember the story of Joseph, that he was a dreamer. And so he had these dreams, and, and uh, his mistake was sharing those dreams yeah. with the wrong people. And so his brother, his brothers hated his dreams. You know, son, everybody, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a ruler, and, and all these things. His brothers hated him because of his dreams, and so they tried to kill him, but they couldn't. And so they sold him into slavery, and they took his coat that he loved so well that had been given to him by his father. They took his coat, they dipped it in animal blood, and then they took it back to Jacob. And uh, Jacob saw it. He said, he began to weep, you know, and said, surely a beast has killed my son. And so they lied, and Jacob believed the lie. And because he believed the lie, then he lost his dream. And whenever he buried that bloody coat, he buried his dream. And how many people in their life have lost their dream because they believed the lie? Yeah. Yeah. The moment wasn't even the truth. It's not something that happened to them, but it's just a lie yeah. that the devil put in their mind. Yeah. And so the devil's working overtime. The Bible says he's, Jesus called him a liar. He's a liar and a deceiver. And so the devil will lie to you. And if you listen to him, you'll lose your dream. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And especially to the older people, he'll tell them, you know, it's over for you or... You know, you're, you're going to die, or you're always going to be sick. You're always going to be broke, and, and your life is over. God is through using you. And yeah. and, uh, and so many times people get in retirement, and they just coast because they believe the lie. They thought God's purpose for them was over. Yeah. 
Amen. But God still has purpose and vision for you. I don't care what age that you are. God still has a reason for you being here. Amen. Still has a purpose. And he wants to revive a new dream in your heart. Amen. And so you can't believe the lies of the enemy. And so if you listen to the devil, you'll always be defeated. And so we have to know how to recognize his voice. And when Jesus was baptized, God spoke from heaven, said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days. And so the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, in other words, he began to question Jesus' identity. Yeah. Yeah. If you're really the son of God, he'll do the same thing with you. Yeah. Begin to challenge your identity. Tell you things like, you're not really saved. Yeah. You know, and God doesn't love you. And, and God's mad at you. And, and all these things that are just lies. And so if he can attack your identity, then he has you. And that's why it's so important to know who you are in Christ. And you're right standing with God, that you're in right standing with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we have to believe that and not listen to the devil's lies. And so if you listen to the devil's lies, then you empower him to defeat you and to work in your life. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. And so the only way that Satan can get an advantage of you is if you're ignorant of his lies and his devices. I got a call a couple of weeks ago from somebody on the line, and they said, uh, you just won uh, Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. Two million dollars and a Cadillac Escalade. And maybe a vacation, too. I can't remember. And so I'm talking on the line. You know, they're telling me all these details and everything about it. So I got on the computer and typed in, Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, and, and so immediately said that the winners are not contacted by phone. And so I immediately knew I was talking to a liar, and I hung up the phone. Come on, if you would do that with yeah. the devil, come on, if you would do that with the devil, he wouldn't be able to fool you or trick you or be able to cheat you. And, uh, and so the only way he can defeat you is if you're ignorant of the way that he works and if you're ignorant of the word of God. Yeah. And so the Bible says that the truth will set you free. It'll make you free. And so if you know the word, the devil can't lie to you. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. he can't deceive you if you know the word of God and you have to stand on the word of God. And so uh, the word device, he talks about the devil's devices. The word device actually means a thought. And that's how the devil works. He speaks to your mind or puts thoughts in your mind. Yeah. And sometimes, many times, people don't recognize those thoughts and they think it's their thought, but it's not really their thought. It is the devil's thought. So the devil will put a thought in your mind then he'll condemn you for thinking that thought. When he's the one who put it in your mind. And so we have to recognize his lies and the thoughts that he puts in our mind. And so that's the... The primary way that he attacks us is through thoughts, wrong thoughts, and lies that he would put in our mind. He did the same thing with Eve. He challenged the word of God. Did God really say? You see, so he tries to get you in the realm of reason. And, and, uh, and so you can't fight the devil in the realm of reason. You have to fight him in the realm of faith. And your faith is based on the promises of God and what the word of God says. And you have to be like Jesus and say... It is written. But you can't say that if you don't know what is written. But you go back to the word of God and say it is written. But you know the devil can even quote scripture. And he, can, he knows the Bible better than a lot of Christians do. And Jacob didn't know it. But help was on the way. Come on, wagons of provision were coming. But he didn't know that they were coming. And some of you have given up your dream. And you don't know that the answer yeah. is on the way. Yeah. Just because you hadn't seen it yet yeah. Yeah. doesn't mean that it's not on the way. Yeah. Just because you can't see it. Because God is working behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've, you know, I've had times when I've had financial needs and, and then I would get a check in the mail. And I, had, and I realized, you know, that check was mailed a week ago. Right when I was thinking about my lack, the devil saying this and that, and 
and the check was already in the mail. It was already on the way. Amen? So you can give up when God's working behind the scenes. Come on, you can be depressed and lose your dream not knowing how God is working, but He's working for your good. Amen? He's working to bring the past, His plan, and purpose for your life. He's working for your good, but you, just because you hadn't seen it in the natural doesn't mean that it's not happening. Amen. And so God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Yeah. And so if God started a good work in you, Paul said, he who began a good work in you will complete that work. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to know that God's going to complete whatever he began. God doesn't start, you know, start a job or start a project or start doing something in your life and then quit halfway. Yeah. But he always finishes. He's always faithful to his word and faithful to his promise. And if he promised you something, he will do it and he will complete it. Amen? Amen. And so it's not, uh, it's not up to us to, to understand how God's going to do it. Amen. We just have to believe that he's going to do it. And so the how is not up to us. It's up to God. And when Moses was leading the children of Israel, he didn't know how God was going to get them across the Red Sea. But that wasn't his problem. That was God's problem. And when Jesus' disciples had to feed the 5,000, they didn't know how it was going to happen. And what was going to happen, how one lunch was going to feed 5,000 people. Yeah. But it wasn't their problem. But it was God's job to do the how yeah. and do the details. Yeah. And sometimes we want to know every little detail yeah. of how God's going to do it before we step out. And that's not how God works. He doesn't explain every little detail to you and how he's going to do it. But God's got a million ways to accomplish his purposes and goals in ways that you never thought of. Amen? So you don't have to understand the how with your mind, but you have to trust God and know that God has a plan, He has a purpose. And so I remember when I graduated from, uh, from Bible College, and, and so I was looking for a job there. We lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We owned a home. My wife had a job there. And so I was looking for a job in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And that was my thinking in the natural, is that we'll work there close to home. You know, that's just logical. So I was looking for a job close to home, but God had something different. And so I had to step out in faith and had to move. And you, you've heard the story before, I couldn't sell my house and, and we've been trying to sell it for six months and haven't been able to sell it. And when I made a decision, we're gonna move to another state to work in ministry, then my house sold within the next two weeks. Amen? Amen. But that seemed like an impossibility but God knew exactly how to work. And it was just up to me to step out in faith and, and for him to bring his provision about. Yeah. And so sometimes people give up because they don't see the how. Yeah. Yeah. Or they don't understand the how. Yeah. Yeah. And they look at what they have and they say it's not enough. Yeah. Or they look at what they can do and they say, well, it's not enough. But you step out in faith and God brings about the how. Yeah. He's the one who works out all the details. Amen? Yeah. And he can work in ways that you've never understood or ways that you never imagined. And so Genesis 45, 27 says, And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Yeah. And so Jacob's dream came alive again. He, he revived. And so Joel said in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. He said your old men will dream dreams. And, and so the, the first time revival is mentioned in the Bible, revive is talking about an old man getting his dream back. And so I believe the outpouring of the Holy Spirit begins with the older generation. Yeah. How many you know revival begins in the church? Yeah. People think if we could get all these sinners saved and to change, then we would have revival. But that's not where revival begins. It begins in the church. Amen. And it starts with the old men. It starts with the older generation. It starts with the seniors of the church. Amen? God wants to stir up something new in your heart. 
Come on, he, he wants to revive the, his power that he's put in your heart. He wants to stir up the gift of God that's still there. Come on, you may be older, but the gift of God is still there. And so even though our, our outer man gets older, Abraham, and he gave him a vision, said he would have many descendants, he was 75 years old. And you think, man, what a, what a time to start. Why would God speak to him? When he was 75, because he just got into the place that he could use him, wow. and uh, and so it began in his old in his older age. God gave him a dream. I love the story of, of Colonel Sanders, who was the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and so he had a successful restaurant on a freeway in Kentucky, and it was making good money. But they moved the freeway. And when he was 62 years old, he had to close down the restaurant. So what did he do? He got his fried chicken recipe and he went around and began to sell it to different restaurants and began to open up or sell franchises when he was 62 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. And by the time, <coughs> and by the time he was 74, he sold out for millions of dollars and sold Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then he became their spokesman until he was 90 when he passed away. And so God, <clears throat> God blessed him in his old age and did something in his old age. I think, think of uh, Pastor Burt Clinton. Yeah. He was a great man of God and pastor of church in Beaumont for 35 years. And so when he was 70, he resigned his church and became a missionary to Russia. And he was talking to my dad. My dad knew him. He actually preached in this church back in, the, I think, the 60s. And so he was talking to my dad, and he said, <coughs> I've always wanted to be a missionary, and I figured when you're 70, it's time to start. And so he went on, and for 20 years, wow. he was a missionary to Russia. Wow. And it started the School of Christ and, and teaching uh, in Bible colleges, and, or teaching this program in Bible colleges. And, and so he didn't begin until he was 70 years old. Smith Wigglesworth didn't go into ministry until he was 55 years old. It's the time some people would retire. That's when he began. He went into ministry and he went for another 30 years until he was 85. And God raised the dead and did great things through his life. And so sometimes it takes God a while to get you to the place that he can use you. But God doesn't look at age the way that people look at age. He doesn't look at, look at it in the natural, but he wants to revive a dream in your heart. Amen? Amen? And so it's not time to quit. It's time to recharge. Amen. Praise God. Jacob was 85 and he said, give me this mountain. And he went in and helped defeat the giants when he was 85 years old. Amen? Amen. God wants to <coughs> begin a revival in the older generation. Amen. Let it start with the older generation. Praise God. And Joel said, you're young men will see visions. And the word see here means to attain. It means that you will attain your vision. Or what you visualize will materialize. And so the devil doesn't want you to see yourself as victorious. He knows the power of vision. And so the second time the word revive is mentioned, <coughs> it's talking about Samson. And so Samson was a, a young man with great strength, and it was supernatural strength. He didn't lift weights or anything like that, but the Spirit of God would come upon him, and he would have supernatural strength. And so God raised him up to be a deliverer and defeat the Philistines. And so he did a lot of bad things to the Philistines, and they came after him to get him. And so they talked some of the men in Judah to bind in Samson. So 3,000 men from Judah went and they bound Samson and they delivered him into the hands of the Philistines. And when that happened, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him. He broke the ropes, picked up the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand Philistines right there. He was bad to the bone. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you imagine, he killed a, a thousand men just fighting hand to hand. And so when he got through, he was exhausted. And so he ran out of strength, and he prayed to God, said, God, I'm going to die if you don't give me some water. And God worked a miracle, and water began to come out of the jawbone of the donkey. And he drank it, and he was refreshed, and he regained his vision. 
He regained his grave. Amen? No enemy outside could defeat Samson, but he was defeated with a lack of strength. But God restored him. Excuse me. And the Holy Spirit is the living water. Amen? And sometimes young people, they're so busy in the battles of life, in the struggles of life, and, and all that they have to do and accomplish, that they can run out of juice and run out of energy. Well, God's got some living water for you. Amen? He's got some water of the Holy Spirit that will restore you so that you can fight again. Come on, and sometimes we run out of strength. But it's the Holy Spirit who energizes us and empowers us. And the Bible says we can be filled with the fullness of God. And so Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that they would be strengthened with might in their inner man. Amen? Yes. Strengthened with might. And you know, when you get tired physically, you can be restored with some sleep and some food and some water. But when you get tired mentally, come on, or your spirit gets tired or down, you can be restored by some power in the Holy Ghost. And as you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, energy and strength is released in your spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to overcome, to get up again, being refreshed, to do the will of God and fight the battles that you need to fight. Praise God. And so, Paul prayed that they would be filled with the fullness of God. And Paul prayed, if Paul prayed that, that means that it is possible for us to be filled with the very fullness of God. We choose what we're filled with. Come on, you can be filled with the news or, you know, filled with your hobbies or, or filled with negative things or wrong things. But you can also be filled with the fullness of God if you'll ask for it. And so, on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It means that they were saturated with the Holy Spirit. If you get baptized in water, you're totally saturated with water. When you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're saturated with the Spirit. Amen? Amen. And so, sometimes you get dry spiritually or dry in your soul, but you can change that as you begin to stir up the gift of God, as you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, you'll feel power coming in. Amen? Amen? And so when the enemy comes in, the Bible says, like a flood, the Spirit of God raises a standard yes. against him. Yes. And whenever it seems like things are difficult, or whenever you feel like giving up, how many know that the Holy Spirit, if you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, Come on, that power will come to do the things that you need to do and overcome the problems that have come up in your life But their supernatural strength. Amen. And, it, and Jesus called it a well. Come on, he called it living water and a well on the inside that will refresh you and flow over to refresh, to refresh other people too. Amen. And so it's time to dream a new dream. And know that God has great things for us. God has great things for this church. Yeah. Amen. He's poured out His Spirit on all flesh. Yeah. We live in the greatest time of history. Yeah. Come on, there's more problems on the future. And, and there's difficult days. But it's the greatest time of history. Because I believe that the greatest revival hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Come on, there's been some great revivals in the past. You know, we're whole towns. God saved. But I believe the greatest revival is yet to come. And I believe that we're right on the verge of it. Amen? We're right on the verge of what God is going to do in the last days. And so the Holy Spirit saying, it's time to dream again. Amen. Come on, some of you may remember great things God did in your life in the past. And, and maybe great times the Spirit of God moved upon you. But it's time to dream again yep. because He's not through with you yet. Come on, he's got greater things, bigger things. And I believe that your latter days are going to be greater than your former days. Amen? The future is going to be better than the past. Praise God. And so God wants to stir up something in your heart. If you'll stand to your feet today.